everyone. My name is Jonathan Dormish. I am your host for Beyond, episode 584. I am joined this week by Max Scoville. Hey. Brian Altano. A star is born. <laughs> and Zachary Ryan. What's up? Hello. Welcome back to the show. It's, it's been, been a while. while. Yeah, it's nice to be here. How are you doing off in Switchland? I'm doing okay. Yeah? Yeah. Seem to have some games over there. Yeah, playing some good games. Yeah, but we're not here to talk about Switch. We're here to talk about <laughs> what's going on with PlayStation. Of course, we're going to talk about the state of play that just happened this past week in our weekly segment, News Crunch. <laughs> Crunch. <laughs> <laughs> A lot going on. I'm always that always there. makes me sort of a little bit hungry and also a little bit aroused. You shouldn't That's be aroused by a child talking. No, and it's a the guy it's, making the it's noise the, of an the apple. The funky guitar gets me randy. Okay, if you're able and to separate the, those layers, that's the word. One thing. The word crunch makes me get a powerful hunger for caramel and crispies. <laughs> All right. I Caramel and know. Krispies were not talked about on the PlayStation State of Play, but they did talk a lot about upcoming games for the PS4 and PSVR. So State yep. of Play was their first attempt, clearly, at a Nintendo Direct uh, to get into it of what was exactly shown before we break down how we felt about the event and the games actually discussed. They announced uh, Marvel's Iron Man VR coming to PlayStation VR in 2019. Uh, they announced... Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled is also getting Crash Nitro Kart content. No Man's Sky is getting a full VR support for PSVR this summer. They introduced a new game called Ready Set Heroes, which is a dungeon-calling multiplayer game. They confirmed Blood and Truth is coming out in May. They also announced basically eight release dates for another handful of PlayStation VR games. They showed a trailer for Observation. They announced Five Night at Freddy's VR. They took a look at Concrete Genie, where they also delayed it to the fall. They showed the Days Gone story trailer and gave us a story trailer for Mortal Kombat 11. So running down the list, it seems like there was a lot there. Yeah. But uh, based on the reaction that I have seen on social media, there has been a bit of a split in how people feel how this presentation went. Mm -hmm. So first of all, before I go into my thoughts about it and how the internet hated those thoughts, I wanted to know what you all thought about the presentation itself beyond the actual content. I thought the presentation was great. I thought it was really nice, and I'm, I'm kind of excited at the idea of this being a regular thing. If this mm -hmm. becomes like the Sony version of a Nintendo Direct, I am all for it. But they 100% need to get in front of their messaging and let us know what we're in for, I think. Yeah, this was uh, exactly what we've been asking them to do, right? I mean, I think we came out of E3 last year being like, what was this like moving stage show across seven theaters that you guys did and then cut to a video podcast or whatever that was? It was kind of messy. Um, this is a lot more focused. I would have liked to have some human element to it. Nintendo's really good at that. Um, I would say my biggest takeaway here was that um, it sort of lacked – a cohesive theme or focus, and it could have. I think this could have just been a PSVR direct state of play, and they could have done eight minutes, 12 minutes, and just been like, here's all our PSVR stuff, here's a price drop, let's get everyone excited. The fact that it was that bookended with some, a little more, I, I think they legally have to put Days Gone at the end of everything. <laughs> and then uh, the the final game they bookended it with, which was Mortal Kombat, which is a, you know, a known quantity. Um, it was cool. It was. It's a good step in the right direction. I, I think they set the bar pretty medium height. I think if they figured out sort of the, the formatting and they were like, here's what's coming out in the next month. Like, here are the big releases. Like, Mortal Kombat and Days Gone are arguably the two biggest games coming out next month. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they were like, hey, we've got a PSVR-centric Nintendo Direct, or not <laughs> State of Play <laughs> we'll coming up, then we're like, that gives us sort of a, a clue of what to speculate on. And that's... Uh, I don't know what's happening. What, I can't hear myself now. They're just filling oh. with knobs over here. That's better. Sorry. It's like getting a head it's cold that drifts fault. in and out. Yeah. Um, but no, like, I, mean, I think if they'd, if they'd been a little bit, because we don't know what this thing is yet. Like, we don't know what a state of play looks like. So we were sort of like, is this going to be a Nintendo Direct? Is this going to be a whole E3 presser? Is this going to be three trailers? It was definitely good, but, but yeah. yeah. It seems like people's expectations were all across the board on this. And yeah. some people were really expecting a give us big reveals, give us a huge announcement, an I, update on Death Stranding or A Last of Us or things like that. Yeah, I think that was my my takeaway from this is like it seemed like a weird it seemed like weird timing on their part to choose right now and these announcements as their first like i would have waited for something bigger to be like this is our first sort of direct style presentation mm -hmm. because it, coming out with this lineup i think <clears throat> i think a lot of people were expecting with a new format meant bigger announcements so i think you're they were kind of setting themselves up to disappoint from the outset sure which is a little strange and also as somebody who works year over year on our E3 live show and works on programming and the content of that show. It's very alarming that these major companies are just doing 
these Their sorts of things, things now. So yeah. it's like, sure. yeah, uh, not, I mean, maybe not alarming is, isn't the right word, but it is definitely a concern. Like, yeah. I think instead of getting like a, a fireworks show once a year, we're getting like sparklers <laughs> well, we talk, <laughs> 12 we, times a year. We kind of talk about this a lot in the office about how E3 is becoming less and less of a, uh, like a major event and more of like a fan driven thing. And like, this just goes to show to me personally that this is sort of the trend that we're going to see. I think more companies are going to move in this direction. It's so much cheaper. It's gotta be so much more cost effective to create these like micro packages and roll them out multiple times a year than renting out a major theater, booking satellite trucks, like coordinating all the event stuff that needs to happen for these big events and, and, putting together an hour plus of content and programming to roll out to millions of people at the same Mm -hmm. time when you can do it six times a year for a fraction of the cost. It's just, it totally makes sense. It's also a good vehicle to, to get some smaller known stuff out there that you probably, if you put it out during E3, I remember like when they were talking about like, uh, you know, PS minis and wonder book and stuff like that back in the day, people were like, get this off the screen. I don't want yeah. this. God, wonder book um, isn't a name that I thought about. Yeah. A hey, uh, years. remember, remember PT. Remember exactly. that was like a thing that we're like, this is available now. And I was like, who cares? Move on to the next stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, and so I think like what was kind of interesting about this is that like in without a, without a, a PlayStation conference last December without an E3 press conference coming up this June, there was, I wouldn't say unreasonably high expectations for what this state of play was, but I think that that, that put a little bit more weight on them. Um, you know, had like Nintendo is basically, they put out a bunch of directs. They have a press conference coming up. They don't have their own convention yet. I'm sure they will someday, but they're, they're busy enough. And like, if you look at their last few directs, not to compare because everybody's working on different stuff, but their last two directs, not including the Pokemon one, which was huge in its own right, you know, it took off on the internet. Uh, both were bookended with new installments and in arguably their second biggest franchise, mm-hmm. which is Legend of Zelda. Um, really easy to cover that show <laughs> over, over on, over on NBC. Whereas, this was sort of like, if we knew we were going to get another one of these every month, then it sort of lowers the the expectations a bit. And but I'm expecting one probably every like three months. Like I, I'd they expect said, seasonal updates. What did they say at the end? It was like just throughout the year. Yeah, throughout we'll, the year. Yeah, right? we'll be doing more of these. And yeah, the the expectations part of it is so fascinating to me because. I, Max, you were saying, and Brian, we've talked about off the air. I agree. Like the way they announced it in their post implied like, oh, this could be a really big thing. There are the embedded ideas of what a Nintendo Direct is Mm -hmm. at the same time. But this has obviously not been conveyed to the whole audience. Like when they announced PSX wasn't happening and they announced they're skipping out of E3, those things came paired with Sean Layden interviews where he's like, we don't have enough big things to talk about right now. So we're not going to do those big scale events when we don't have that. Mm -hmm. So they have had some of that messaging out there, but that no way gets to people in the way that this announcement post does. I mean, that should have been part of this. E3 doesn't make sense in its current form anymore because games come out year round. They're yeah. not just a holiday release thing. And to do this thing quarterly or to do it monthly doesn't make sense either because if you're like, we're going to have you know a 20 minute thing in like in April when there's not a ton of stuff coming out, but here's what's coming out. And then they were like, if they're like, here's the November one. It's going to be three hours long. Yeah. Like you're going to have to kind of stagger it and plan, you know, plan accordingly. But yeah. I like the idea of it being sort of, um, I think themes are great. I think leaning yeah. into being like, Hey, you know, we've got some, you know, huge first party stuff on the way or, Hey, we're talking PlayStation VR or. I, yeah. yeah. I think that's my thing is like, ultimately I, I think it's the right idea and I think it's the right call from both like a financial and a marketing uh, aspect or, or view. Um, I just think that it completely lacks the the wherewithal and the personality of a Nintendo Direct. That's exactly and, it. And I think that that Sony will get there. I think that we're seeing, you know, as the the very first of, of probably many of these presentations, they're, they've got a lot of kinks to work out, and I'm sure that they'll get there because they've put together some pretty entertaining presentations before, and admittedly some pretty weird ones as well. But I think it's just going to take a little time. This kind of felt like uh, like a promotional video that you would run in like a GameStop or a Best Buy. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. that's a really good point. And like yeah. the kind of thing where you can just sort of you don't have to listen to it, but you just kind of look up and you're like, oh yeah, new yeah. games are coming. Out. I watched this presentation while I was on a conference call for yeah. like on another meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I do wonder if some of the like formatting of it was in, so in response to the negative attention they got for the E3 conference last year, which was so like lengthy and indulgent and yep. did have people talking, but it. Like it just went on and on and on instead of being to the point. And this was like so to the point that it then sucked 
any personality out of it. Yeah, it's and cool. the thing is, like, Sony or PlayStation specifically has a bunch of really great people working there. There are a lot of really personable people who are great on camera, who are great on stages, who can get up in front of a, a live show even when things are crashing and breaking, and they can do 20 minutes of pacing back and forth, you know, it, not even re- reading off a teleprompter or making it look natural. So having them look direct to camera, I know people would be like, oh, you're ripping off Nintendo Direct. Who cares? Just, yeah. just get the message. I don't think they invented that and talked yeah. directly to a camera. <laughs> no, definitely not. Uh, no, I mean, we let's, let's, not to sound like a Nintendo apologist or anything, but you can watch NBC every Thursday at 3 p.m. or listen to it. But um, I'm muting your mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, but uh, everyone has always copied Nintendo, right? Yeah. Nintendo has always done something first, and everybody sort of filed suit. So it totally makes sense that they would they would pioneer this direct format, and then uh, you know everybody else would follow suit. I think that that one thing that Sony lacks right now is the ability to put those people out in front of camera or really identify who those people are. Yep. We see Sean Layton every year at E3, but like we don't see anybody from Sony Santa Monica. We don't see anybody from Sony Bend to really like as a spokesperson or even yeah. like a second, like a vice president or something. It's always just Sean or just voiceover or, you know. So I think they should bring out somebody in that Crash Bandicoot costume. I don't care if he's not the mascot. Give him the anymore. megaphone. Bring have it back. Why not? There. I have Send an important down. announcement to make. I'm leaving IGN. The official <laughs> you'd be Crash great because you'd be so mascot. sweet. Yeah. <laughs> you'd be in the Nintendo parking lot with that megaphone. You'd be like oh, whispering. Hey, like, you guys make great games too. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to be mean about it, but I just we want, we've got some great VR titles on I the really way. Appreciate if you try uh, PSVR. Uh, security's here. I'm sorry about that. Any- <laughs> no, Zach. Zach, I love that. I think like the idea of elevating those people, and we've all you know we've met them. They've been on our live shows sure. here. Like they're they're all great people working at those studios. Every one of those studios has outspoken, talented, smart motherfuckers, and like it'd be really cool to see them out there. I mean, we've had some of them on the show. Like Corey yeah. Corey Barlog's a great example. I, Brian I don't Indahar. understand. I don't understand why Brian and Corey wouldn't be like the front runners for that position. You yeah, know what I mean, like obviously they have other work to do. Like. <laughs> You know, they're working on some first-party games. Party just games came out. But yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. also, it, they just seem like those guys are like household names amongst PlayStation fans now. I don't understand why they wouldn't be chosen to deliver that messaging. Yeah, they could get it up there and read a script, and it wouldn't take like they, they could come there and just cycle. be like, "Hey, we're excited for uh-huh. the state of play to do X, Y, and Z." Yeah, exactly. D- yeah, It'd be funny fun if, if, if like, like Brian Antahar came out and he was like, you know I love Spider-Man, but you know who else I love? Iron Man. Here's the game <laughs> about Iron Man made by a different studio. <laughs> I think it'd be really That'd be funny. Great. I, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of, <laughs> you know I love Spider-Man, but you know who else I love? Genies. <laughs> Let's take a look at this. Genie and Concrete Genie. <laughs> Some have called Spider-Man the original Concrete Genie. <laughs> Some. Not many. Anyway, here's Concrete Genie. I spent a lot of days at Insomniac, but I would only spend five nights at Freddy's. Here's five nights at Freddy's in VR. Um, God of War has lots of combat between mortals, but you know what else does? <laughs> um, no, I mean, like, to really focus on the positives here, I think it's awesome that they're doing this. I think the fact that, once again, we're going into a new year going major confidence in PSVR as a platform. That's huge. It shows they're not giving up on that. Again, I would have loved to see that book ended with a price drop. There, there are like that a bunch of people didn't... who are just kind of like, when do I buy this? Yeah, you know, that they so didn't announce funny. a sale. It's so funny because like so many, I saw so many reactions on Twitter that were just like, "Oh, it's just PSVR games," and it's like, "Hey, you guys are missing out." Yeah, like yeah. The, 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 those of you with that attitude, like you're missing out on really cool stuff yep. because you've dismissed this pla- entire part of this platform. We had two yeah. Game of the Year nominees last year. That That's were right. Either yep. PSVR solely or very heavily yeah. involved. I think it's yeah. it's very easy for gamers to go like, "That's expensive and stupid, and I don't want to wear it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna." Look, Cast it aside, but like it's not going away. Look at the reaction to Stadia last week. Like, yeah, I don't want to like I don't want to get us too far off topic, but like nobody knows what that thing is really about. Yep. Like, the the reaction was overwhelmingly negative, and it's like, hey, a year from now, you might be looking at it like, oh, this is actually a, like viable concept, and I'm interested. Well, so. I think a lot of gamers reacted to that like if like the government was like. Hey, we're taking your guns. Yeah, <laughs> like that was that was a lot of people being like, Google was like, you don't even need consoles or games anymore, and people were like, fuck you, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> And so to that, I understand a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it, was it last week we just went kind of overboard talking about No Man's Sky? Yeah. And I don't regret that one bit because them just being like, oh, by the way, it's entirely PSVR mm-hmm. compliant is it's like... a completely different way to experience that game. Yeah. I've been yeah, hoping, a new game. I've been hoping yep. they would do that since I think before they launched when mm-hmm. I was like, I think it's going to be a VR game. Yeah. Lo and behold. Yeah. Finally. That, that was, I think, one of the biggest announcements. And had they fronted this as this is a PSVR, <clears throat> excuse me, state of play, 
and bookended with Iron Man and No Man's Sky. Oh, God, yeah. Be like, it's about setting expectations, yeah. Yeah. right? Like, nobody gets disappointed in Nintendo Direct when they don't announce a new Mario game when it's a Pokemon Direct. Yeah, or exactly. And they're really good about that. And it's always just like two sentences in yeah. an email to everybody, to the press and to the public. They'll go like, hey, we have a Direct coming out this Thursday. It focuses on Fire Emblem and Nintendo 3DS. And you're like, wow, I just moved the goalposts right yeah. down yeah. the field on what this right. thing could be. Whereas this announcement was PS4 and PSVR games, new game announcements and gameplay footage yeah so you're like okay days gone for gameplay footage yep probably concrete genie because it was supposed to come out in the spring but maybe days death stranding or maybe the last of us like that there is an inborn like oh they could do this yep and they didn't yep. um wait m- one question to you yeah. guys do they do one of these at e3 not uh, at not at you i don't think say so around. before yeah after. i would say before yeah. after, probably before because yeah. they said before would make a ton of sense they yeah. said yeah. no press conference <laughs> But they did pull out of the show floor too, as far as I know, right? Like yeah. I think they just said they're not going to E3 at all. Mm-hmm. Who was? Were they doing? Uh, excuse me if I don't remember this right. Were they doing like pre E3 stuff? Who was doing pre E3 like reveal stuff? Uh, what do you mean? Well, like um, there was some. Oh yeah, Sony last year did like, okay. a week of pre E3 right mm-hmm. announcement. Like Judges so, yeah. Week stuff or not even Judges Week. It was just like dr- it was trickling in like the things oh, that would get yeah, lost yeah. on the, on the yeah. way. So that would be that's super smart if you're gonna if there's gonna be stuff on the floor whether it's at their at, at, I guess they don't have a booth but like if they have you know third party stuff if they want to announce things if they want to just kind of signal boost things that are out there mm-hmm. then they get in front of the messaging and it's sort of like here's what to look for like, take, mm-hmm. you know, check this out it'll well, be I mean if you consider the promotional space on a website like IGN right you have five or four slots in your like front page and then a bunch of like blog roll tiles and when you're a company at E3 and you're announcing on the Monday or Tuesday of a five day run, you're competing for those, let's say 10 slots with every other developer and publisher at the same exact time. Yep. So Bethesda announcing fallout four in the middle of October or whatever, or like uh, red dead, right? Like puts them outside of that conversation. And then all of a sudden you see IGN and Kotaku and Polygon yep. with five stories about Red Dead and four stories about Fallout and not, you know, this mm-hmm. competing space. Yeah, I mean, so E3 it, made a ton the, of sense in yeah. 1995 when video games came on cartridges. Right. There were about 75% less of them, and they only came out between September and December. And you read about them in magazines. Exactly. Yeah. Those things yeah. that they sold at Walgreens. Like It's also <laughs> like if you look at, like, the, you know, the the resources that the average YouTuber has to even cover this, even cutting out traditional media people, they're, they're going to make all please their no. big videos. Yeah, please no. <laughs> um, but they're going to make all their videos that day. We're YouTubers too, you know? Yeah. Um, we, we have a little YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> I lo- but they're going to run out of steam. I love to steam. watch that. Sorry. Stop <laughs> Side note, we published the uh, Los Angeles episode of Fast Travel last year in the middle of the Ubisoft press conference update too. I have it's no idea what all that was. That was, uh, that was tough to watch. Yeah, it's, it's a weird one where like, had this been, had they still done an E3 press conference and all of this was part of it you would have been like why why did they have a yeah, press yeah, conference totally. so i understand and then someone on twitter said to me they were like why didn't they just put up seven different videos on youtube so i could watch the trailers for these and it's like you wouldn't watch them. you wouldn't watch them. yeah they, that's exactly yeah, you need, nailed it they do need to set up expectations properly but they also know that if you, they just put up seven trailers in the morning yeah no one's gonna watch five of them well that was like that nindy's direct thing you watch every one of those games because you don't know what's going to come next there's that sort of surprise box mm-hmm. to it yeah um which i really i love that i really love that because and i've said this before and the same thing the store the storefronts the digital storefronts do the same thing, where it gives your game the same amount of real estate, uh, whether you're Zelda or Mario or Crash Bandicoot or The Last of Us or, you know, the genie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I went to, moving just right along from that, I went to the <laughs> Podcast Beyond Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash group slash podcast beyond to ask people how they felt about the first PlayStation Direct. Uh, got a large variety of responses. Uh, Connor Weir just posted a cat shaking its head no gif. Uh, Dan Cool said, I loved it. I think it's funny. People thought we were going to get surprise announcements when we basically know everything else coming this gen, other than some release dates that the devs themselves don't know yet. Right. A lot to be hyped for if you own VR. No Man's Sky made my pants tingle, and you can quote me on that. What does that mean? I don't want to know. Uh, I saw wash, the pants. wash your pants. It's weird that the pants tingle. Do you think there's some kind of <laughs> debris in the pants? Do, oh, also, these are like sentient pants with nerves? I don't understand. <laughs> are they fleece lined? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Muhammad, <Manure Hadid>. George. <laughs> Muhammad Hadid said just okay observation and concrete genie got put on my wish list already in for MK11 days gone back to back next month the mm-hmm. VR stuff when you know the PS5 is coming soon and VR would be an order of magnitude better than what we have now it's hard to put down the money for one just now though. that's a really good point 
Yeah. I mean, we don't know what that looks like. We're still controlling those games with move controllers that came out in 20 fucking 10. Yep. So use, use a different type of plug. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I love I love PSVR. I'm so like I'm so ready for a different one. Me too. Yes. Yeah. Me uh, too. Even with like I'm excited for I think they showed like nine or ten VR games. I'm excited to play like at least eight of them. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I would love for that tech to just keep if, advancing. If they really launch like a truly wireless version of that system with with updated controls, like goddamn. Yeah. That's that perfect. Cool. Um, I mean, that's a game changer. I know. Like, if yeah. they if they did that because the PlayStation name is so. Uh, sort of ubiquitous, yep. right? Like, I, I think that, that the idea of making a streamlined wireless VR headset would completely change the way that people think about not just PSVR, but, like, VR in general. Yeah, no, yeah. totally. I mean, it's the best-selling VR kit currently, and that's yeah. with big players out there constantly iterating on their systems and taking out, you know, massive ad revenues, taking over entire trade shows. Like, yeah. Oculus is, you know, that, is, that has become a formidable name, but PlayStation is PlayStation. Yeah, the know? Oculus Quest coming out being wireless. I'm curious to see how that moves the needle as well mm-hmm. uh yeah they announced psvr has sold through 4.2 million units That's yeah. much. as of That's march huge. 3rd which is great the last update i think was 2 million yeah. yep. so clearly that holiday sales saw a huge spike mm-hmm. um but that is still a small segment of the 90 plus million ps4 That's what owners. like five percent or something yeah it's yeah it's a small it's drop f- it's pocket. like 40 percent of all the wii u sold too <laughs> which is weird when you put it that way yeah that's that's, that's a Sounds catastrophic failure, yeah. effectively. Um, but so, yeah, looking forward, what do you all want, just to go quickly back to it, what do you all want to see either in the cadence of these and the format of these? What is, like, one really big thing you want them to keep from this initial one? What is something you want to see them change, Zach? I think highlighting um, a broad spectrum of titles, you know, like something something like Concrete Genie and something like Mortal Kombat in the same announcement or the same t- like timeline is really interesting to me. Um, but I, I think that the biggest miss for me was the, just the lack of personality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Brian, what about you? Yeah, uh, just a cohesive theme, I think, or at least something, some umbrella shaped thing where they can be like, these are what this is, what you can expect, and there might be some other stuff, but something like that, just to go, it's PSVR, it's indies, or it's like, here's what all of our third party friends are working on, something like that. Yeah. And Max, I think it was really promising. Um, I think a little more personality wouldn't hurt. I think once they've kind of they've again found their cadence and found their, you know, their strong suit, they got to realize that there is inevitably going to be people who tune in regardless of what it's about. Uh, but to make stuff that's sort of you know for the the more casual fair weather people being like, hey, mm-hmm. here's a special Death Stranding, whatever, you know, and then it's. You know, make it more targeted. Yeah, I would love to see the form take whatever steps it needs to. So maybe they do a Last of Us state of play for 10 minutes, one month down the line. But mm-hmm. another is just PSVR, things like that. I would love to see them do that. But I did really love seeing like Falcon Age and Trover Saves the Universe and all these things that I think look really great, but probably most mainstream audiences would not have seen otherwise. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, right. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how the state of play is going forward. But for games you can actually play right now, we obviously want to talk about Sekiro. Shadow Ooh. Side Twice. Uh, I know... There's a lot of love for this game in the office. I have not gotten too far in it, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But I want to take the temperature of you guys about how you're feeling about it, obviously in regard to Bloodborne as well. <coughs> so we've talked a lot about that. Zach, would you like to start? As uh, our sure. Guest of honor? Um, I love Sekiro so much. Yeah, I, yeah I'm a FromSoft guy. Um, I kind of I came into it at Bloodborne and then have gone back and played Dark Souls and Dark Souls Two and Three and um, multiple times. And I like I love their games. I think they're a singular developer, and Sekiro is no different. It it really takes the formula that they built on in Bloodborne and, and sort of turns it on its ear and refines it further. And it it is a fantastic game, and mm-hmm. it is so super challenging and so like frustratingly difficult, and ultimately so incredibly rewarding and just gorgeous to look at i'm i'm loving it so yeah i'm uh, just uh, like mcdonald's <laughs> <laughs> i i adore this game um i'm in the same boat it's um it's t- tingling my jorts Whoa. as that man would say mm-hmm. no it's a uh, it what what it's doing really well that i'm i'm i wasn't really expecting is it's giving me that same sort of uh palpable fear that i had turning corners in bloodborne of being like What's here? What's around the corner here? Like, what is this building? What's, you know, am I going to get surprise attacked? Um, I, f- I have an interesting relationship with it because I sometimes sit down to play it and feel like I'm a god and I'm awesome. And then I come back like the next day or a few hours later and I'm, I forgot how to parry and I, yeah. I like had a counter. And I find that really interesting. But I, um, I've been playing it like I played Bloodborne, which is 
running up and down the first few or three or four areas repeatedly to grind like crazy to improve. Uh, IGN has a bunch of really great videos out about, you know, stuff you should do first and like cool tips. One thing I will point out on the first skill tree in that game, if you save up uh, to the third level, there's something that costs five points that gives you health for every time you sneak attack someone. I, I ground out last night and yeah. bought that on your recommendation. It's and immensely it changes the helpful. way I play the game. Yeah. Like, it, it, it's so much better. Yeah. It doesn't feel like you're just constantly bleeding out like a stuck yep. pig. Like, you always have a chance to sort of like recuperate a little health. Um, going into boss encounters, I, I find myself like not entirely great at countering most of the time um it's rhythmic and i'm and i'm getting better at it but i do find that there's a lot more room for error than i thought there would be in terms of like cheesing some of these bosses and some of the like you can kind of just jump in the air and be like yeah yeah <laughs> and stab them a lot and back yeah, out it, and- it's funny i've been playing it so we i guess we should probably back up so for those of that aren't in the know Mm-hmm. Sekiro is a ninja action game from from software that is, you know, sword and board essentially without the board. Like you're blocking and deflecting and yeah. parrying, like, uh, and you get these things called death blows and stuff. But um, yeah, I, I I found myself dying over and over and over again to this this mini boss last night, and it was getting really super frustrating. And I've been doing my best to play without looking up strats on bosses. And this is the second time that I've been like, I have no idea how to beat this guy. Like, I'm just gonna look it up. Like, I, I, I have to look up like a tutorial video or something. So I found a tutorial video, and the answer was literally just don't stop attacking. Like, just run in and just attack as much as possible, as fast as possible, right. and you'll eventually break this guy's parry and get through. And I took him out on the next run. Wow. Yeah, I must have died to him 15, 20 times. <laughs> and then I watched one tutorial video and was like, oh, you just got to just beat the hell out of mm-hmm. him. Got it. Okay. And just ran in yep. and did it. You know, so it's like... Um, the way that you approach each enemy, each boss especially, is so different because unlike Bloodborne where it was like, or, or Dark Souls where it's so much about like parrying and uh, positioning yourself correctly, like that weighs into it as well. But even more so than that, I feel like a lot of the bigger enemies, a lot of the mini bosses and stuff have specific uh, weaknesses. Yeah. You know, like it's almost like an RPG where like, fire is weak against water or ice is weak against fire something like that where each boss has like a specific like this boss you can take down a lot easier if you have the loaded axe or this boss is a lot easier if you have the fire barrel and it's it's really cool how there's there's like people in the world who are just hanging out talking to each other and you can eavesdrop on them and they'll give you clues Um, there's a lot of like i came into this game like all of us did with with FromSoft ptsd which was expecting uh, if you if you don't tiptoe around ledges you die instantly uh, every time like there's no training every time you get killed you lose everything you've ever had um, all that all that kind of stuff and what I found was something that is as difficult as the rest of those games but has a lot of the sort of I wouldn't say cheapness but it just has a lot of quality of life improvements that make the moment to moment a lot better you can fill up a meter uh, and basically get a point to upgrade your skill and nothing can take that from you which is insane. That's never happened before. Well, Usually, if like, you die, if you die, you lose half your experience. Yeah, but yeah. not if you have a point locked in already. Right. So Correct. that basically, you fill one meter, that meter is locked, and then you go to fill the next one, you lose half your experience from there. But even then, there's like a one in whatever your number chance is that uh, you'll get lucky. <laughs> right now, my percentage is seven. Yeah, yeah. it gets lower it and lower the more 30, you die. Right? Yeah, because yeah, you get this like yeah. dragon rot or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so I love all that. I mean, the fact that there's a there's a guy, there's a training guy in the game mm-hmm. that teaches you how to, how to fight. That's they've never done that, you know, because they don't tell you where he is. But (laughs) yeah, he's there. You got to find him. I didn't know about that. Mm -hmm. How much have you played? Uh, I don't know. I've sunk a few hours in. Um, God, I'm bad at games, like really, really bad at games. And I'm I'm, this one. I can't tell if I first of all, it's an incredibly it's a really good game. Like I can just recognize that right off the bat. And I completely agree with everything everything you said, Zach, about FromSoft. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I've completely fallen in love with Bloodborne, but it's also sort of instilled me with some habits that are hard to break when approaching Mm -hmm. a game. Uh, And I mean, it's weird because you have to be, you have to have both sort of sharp reflexes, but also be patient, which seem almost counterintuitive to me. Uh, This is an incredibly fast paced game, but if you rush things, you'll get your ass handed to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I, I found that I was talking to you about this, Jonathan, but like the, the, my weird thing is like, I'm, sort of impatient with things that should be done at like a fast pace but not too fast of a pace which i guess is just sort of mashing buttons uh, you know not not just like blindly mashing but mashing the same button and uh yeah it's like you got to find your sort of the right cadence and like kind of approach things with sort of a good kind of confidence um and it's also it's strange to see 
stealth and completely wide open, fast paced traversal thrown in here. Yeah. Yeah. The mobility of it really struck me. It's phenomenal. Yeah. There's there's an area that I'm in right now. I'm in this castle where uh, you can literally Spider Man around the castle. Yeah. Like with the grappling hook, you can just chain grapples and and you don't have to touch the ground. It's, it's crazy. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, I appreciate that too because it's like when you're grinding in Bloodborne, I feel like there's always the chance that a guy is going to get hit you in the face with a shovel or like a pickaxe and kill you. Whereas in this game. Grinding has been really fun for me because I have memorized enemy locations and the exact amount of time it takes one of them to go, huh? And then he gets stabbed and you can sneak up and chain basically and kill one in the back and you can one hit almost every enemy in the game except for mini bosses, which is really cool because it makes it so when you're going through areas that you've been through before, you, it's not really tedious and you feel like there's a reward for it. And you can jam through them too. Yeah. Yeah. Like last night, the area that you're in now. I, I know that area so well that last night I just did it on loop like three or four times yeah. to get to that fifth level so I could buy that upgrade that you were talking about That's earlier. awesome. Yeah, and it's just like I was listening to a podcast and just jamming through this one area like four or five times. It was great. I really appreciate all of the like weird, mysterious, spooky horror stuff in this game. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's like headless demons and, you know, giant animals and there's also – Funny shit like gi giant fucking roof roosters that kill oh, you. Oh, those chickens are yeah. the worst. Yeah. Did you? There's this one area in the Harada Castle where there's just like 15 chickens all yeah. hanging out, <laughs> yeah. and there's just dead bodies everywhere. And you're like, "What did you guys do?" <laughs> and the first time I like came on one of, I came up to one of those like. I didn't know what it was. I just saw like this like weird, it looked like a coat mm -hmm. on like a cliff. And I walked up, I'm like, oh, is this like free clothes? From my... And it was just like, Rah! and jumped in the air, jump kicked me. It's like the crows in Bloodborne. Yeah. And it started clawing at my face. Uh, and then there's that weird, like in that one area, there's like a husband and wife chicken where you kill one of them. The other one runs out. He's like, what have you done? <laughs> that was Harry. I didn't know they husband. were married. They're married. Yeah. Wow. There's rings on their hands. Yeah. And you can find, you can find, when you kill one of them, you find the lore in the item. Exactly. Yeah. I was going to say, is there an audio log that yeah. you pull? Uh, They've been dating me, since high school. It took me a cool minute. You had to, you have to like vacuum up the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like. I don't. Know you don't have to hold the button that hard, by the way. Okay. Like I, I didn't been, know. I've that. just been mashing on it, and just I don't. Yeah. I'm not doing it the right pace. No, I was I playing mean, that game I like mean. fucking Luigi's Mansion for a while, where I was just like dun dun, dun yeah. <laughs> sucking up. Oh yeah. You really only have to hold it down for like a second, and then it all comes to you. But it took me. Also, like, I, <laughs> they there. There's no like. There's no tutorials. Menu in there, like there's no like help section. Which there's I was a training like, man. I told you. Okay, that's a man. Yeah, that's who's a like tutorial I, again. Man. I haven't found. It, you go to the you go to the menu, like, and I I know that it's sort of get good and figure it out. And a lot of people have said like, oh yeah, read the read the digital tutorial for Bloodborne. It tells you things you should the game should have told you. But it's like, this is definitely I never did that. That's yeah, a thing. I don't know. You figured it out. You talked to people. No, I I I, I wish I had done that. Yeah. I, they're still like when I played Bloodborne, I'll get, I'll get an item and I'm and I'm like, I don't know what that well, is. Well, I mean that is that is straight up the beauty of FromSoft games is that they are they are dense and sort of opaque. Obtuse, yeah. yeah. Yeah, opaque, obtuse enough that they uh, require you to talk to other people, whether that's your friends in real life or strangers on the internet, mm -hmm. who will give you different pointers and tell you stuff and you kind of compare notes about how things work. And it is entirely recreating that sort of playground feeling of, you know, old games like Legend of Zelda or Castlevania or Ninja Gaiden, where it's like, what did you do here? How did you do this? Yeah, the three of us talked for 20 minutes yesterday in what felt like uh, like a probably less cursing, but a, a version of like the conversations we would have had if we all went to middle school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where, some, where Zach was like, there's a fire castle and you can get a, yeah. you can get an axe. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> yeah. And I felt really cool because I'd found that, but you didn't. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. I you saw your read. eyes light up. You were like, oh, you haven't, you haven't <laughs> been to the <laughs> castle? Yeah. Um, it's, it's weird, though, because what I love about uh, I love about Bloodborne and in what I've seen of Dark Souls, which I, I bought on Switch, and I sort of regret <laughs> I that. I just did the same it's, thing. It's really, it's yes. really hard to I own remastered on PS4 and played through it last year and then today when I was uh when I was playing uh, or last night when I was playing Sekiro I was like I could play Dark Souls mm -hmm. <laughs> I got this like Goldilocks scenario though where I've like sort of finally figured out Bloodborne and uh -huh. I'm like I'll check out Dark Souls I'm like this is too slow and I get secure I'm like this is too fast yep. <laughs> and I also still haven't finished Bloodborne so I should probably just go play that but yeah uh, it I, is, the thing the thing is Bloodborne is like it's fast and it, I love the way you have to explore it. It has this like very labyrinthian feel to it, and like Dark Souls has kind of the same vibe. With Sekiro, it feels almost like cheating to be able to kind of jet around it, and there still are sort of hidden pathways. Yeah, well, it's 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 crazy to me. Like there are so many hidden pathways, mm -hmm. and and last night I was playing through an area that I was like, oh, this feels weirdly familiar, and then I turned a corner and realized that it's 
just the first area from the game, except it's been repopulated by different characters, huh. and like I just entered from a different side. I was oh, like, whoa. oh wow, how did I get back here? Like, yeah, it's there's, really wild. There's something I think with I mean, people say like one of the things you need to get good at with FromSoft games is remembering where enemies are. Mm-hmm. Like that's just memorization, which I kind of adore because that's not that doesn't come down to reflexes. I'm good at memorizing things, but when you can just jet around so much, it feels like it almost you're less likely to sort of ingrain those those patterns in your head. Like if you're, I've I've had I've gotten turned around, mm-hmm. but not in that like oh god I'm lost. It's more like wait I overshot where I was going. Like right. I, I jumped off a big tower and landed on a tree branch, and I'm like wait I oh, I'm back where I started. Mm-hmm. I do. And I feel like because of the speed of of the traversal, it makes me almost sort of impatient to like take my time with the enemies and grind and there is know. a very specific tension in this game that I don't I haven't necessarily felt in other games uh, other from soft games part of that I think is because of the dragon rot like the more you die the more people in the world get dragon rot and mm-hmm. elongates a quest later in the game where you have to like cure all these people right so what yeah so uh, that's yeah so the, the people in the world get dragon rot and you can beat the game without curing it or you can go and figure out the way to cure it and, and fix all these people but the more times you die the more people in the world get it and the more people you have to seek out and cure right, right. so uh, or that's my understanding so far I, um, I've currently cured everybody but then I went and fought like Juju the drunken puker and, yeah. and yeah, died and so like 20 you, times yeah, so now they're all sick every time again. that I die I'm like okay I've died at least 25 times so like I, I understand that there's more people out there that yep. are getting the black lung and yeah. it's my fault but yeah <laughs> You know what sucks about this game? They called it Shadows Die Twice. They sh- that, that's that's sh- yeah. Shadows die at least sixteen times. Shadows <laughs> die infinite. Yeah. I do think it's awesome that you can die two times in this game. Sometimes three. Because yeah. the first time I got killed, and it was just like wake up again and I was like wait what and like if you wait a minute a lot of the men in the game were just like we got him and they turn around and you're like haha and you that stab is, them in the back that is one of the coolest mechanics yeah. I feel like it is completely underselling like it's people haven't sort of I think wrapped their heads around it properly to it's, properly be like yeah it's like multiple layers of risk reward yeah. right? like it's really cool yeah, depending cool. on like when you decide to come back yep. totally a mm-hmm. fight yeah so I've played maybe three or four hours of it I'm still very early um, just getting through the Harada estate like the first memory sort of thing played a little bit of the entry area and I'm like kind of resigned to the fact that I will probably never play through a FromSoft game yeah um, there's there's this weird like the patience that you need to be able to deal with its pace whether it's very slow or very fast or just right um, I feel like I don't have that patience currently because when I hit that wall and I'm like, I just keep dying and I just keep dying and I just keep dying. I have 10 other games I could play. Mm. I have 20 movies I could watch. Or I have all these things. Like I haven't gotten to the point in a FromSoft game yet where I feel that sense of reward yeah. for having fought through it. So you and I were texting about this this weekend, yeah. right? Like the actual real world dragon rod of playing a From Software game where you, you, play the same area or fight the same enemy so many times that you get actively worse because you're getting frustrated or your reflexes yep. are off. Yeah. Every every boss you beat is a load of laundry you didn't do. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> but it's like the ability to, and this is something that hit me really hard on Saturday because I was trying to beat the second boss before I had fought the first boss. I just didn't know it. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to beat this boss for well over two hours. And then finally I was just like, I have to play something else or I have to do something else because like obviously what I'm doing here isn't working. Yeah. And so I took a break and came back the next day and upgraded some of my stuff and went back and fought that boss and did it in like two shots. And it's a different it's like a different story when you, yeah. when you do it because you feel like a different person. And like that's what's cool about this game is that it's in Bloodborne I I will grind and level up and I do this in Dark Souls too and I will dump a bunch of points into some stat and kind of hope for the best. Like I'm just sort of just like, oh, what's like our what's arcane shoes? <laughs> and we'll, we'll get those, I guess. And like the at the end of the game they're like you're 14 points short to use like the, you know, the magical hat. And I'm like, I don't know what I did wrong. I always feel like I'm building the wrong character. Right. And then people have, are like, oh, did you know about the hard cap, soft caps that you can do? On, and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. This is confusing for me. Whereas in, in this game, I can be like, oh, uh, I unlocked a move that lets you do four stabs when you jump. And I'm yeah. like, I understand that. Sure. Yeah, th- and so th- there's like this quantifiable buildup. But also, you most- can pause it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the most interesting part to me about Sekiro is like, this is the first FromSoft game where like, you know the meme around FromSoft is like get good, yeah. But this is the first game where like you actually really have to get good, yeah. And uh, you can buy fifteen different move sets or or ninja moves or whatever. But if you don't know how to utilize those, if you can't yep. look at the way your opponent is standing or or see an opening in his attacks or whatever. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Like you can launch that attack and still get your ass whooped, right? And there's no since it's not um, online in the same way that the other games were. 
you know, like I, I have no qualms in saying like the only reason that I beat Bloodborne the first time through was because I summoned somebody in to help me right. defeat that last boss. And there's bosses in Dark Souls where I did the same. That doesn't exist here. Yeah, you don't and, like, have that There's option a legitimate there. concern where I'm like, okay, I'm having this much trouble on boss number four. Yep. When I get to boss 12 or whatever, am I going to have the right stuff to like get actually like actually get past that yep. boss? So. Yep. And that, that sort of worry freaks me out with because I did die enough to get someone to have Dragon Rot. And I was like, oh, am I screwing my game over so much that I'm early enough? Should I just like restart the game? I, I like, did do that. Yeah. yeah, I did restart it. But then now so many people in my village have the rot that it doesn't even <sighs> the <rot>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. They got the rot, man. Uh, do you guys need to chat? Yeah, we got to go. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian and Zach, so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. It's yeah, nice anytime. Back. Uh, before we continue the show, Matt, Max and I will. Uh, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, I'm at Twitter, on, or I'm on Twitter at ZacharySD. And Brian? I'm at Agent Bizzle, uh, and if you are in Boston for PAX East this weekend, come say hi. Come to our GameScoop panel. Um, it's on Thursday? It's Thursday. It's on thir- yes. Yeah. So this will be up. In then. one of the theaters. In one of the theaters, yeah. Anyway, You'll find thank it. Thank you guys so much. Love you. It. Bye. Max, I want to keep talking with you about Sekiro for a minute. Let's wait till they leave. Oh, uh, you just want to... secrets. Go on, then. Ooh. Get out, then, you rascals. I hate it. Mm. All right. So how do you really feel? Oh, man, I suck so much. <laughs> That's um, my fear. No, I'm so bad at it. Here's but. the thing. I feel like this is a game... I'm, I'm like really conflicted about it because I've, I've reached a few stopping points where I'm just... There's that scene in Superbad where Michael Sarah is like playing like Time Splitters or something. And he's yeah. like, why did, why did they even make the game? Why did they even make the game? You can't, you can't play it. You can't win it. And <laughs> he just like throws a controller. And I'm like, that's 100% how I feel. Yeah. Um, where I'm just like, first of all, it feels like it is difficult in ways that I am speci- specifically tailored to, for me to suck at it. Like Bloodborne, I definitely kind of sort of made my peace with and figured it out. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, this is hard. But at least like when I need to, I can call in one of the bloody buddies by ringing a funny <laughs> bell and they come in and they, you know, do my They'll work for me. They'll help you out, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're using your lifeline. Uh, here, there's, there's no option for that. And on top of that, like the world of Bloodborne is fascinating to me. It's full of monsters and horrors and guys with pitchforks and stuff. And I'm just not into samurai stuff. Right, right. And playing it, I'm like, I, it's making me weirdly more excited for um, Ghost of Tsushima. Yeah. Because I'm like, I, there's a bunch of stuff. I like the monsters in Sekiro. I think, I'm, I don't I don't know, like there's some of the architecture's cool, but like there's something that just doesn't grab me in there. Sure. I but mean, like the, the ballet of like sword play I feel like Ghost of Tsushima, like the little gameplay we've seen, will almost be like an easier version of Sekiro in some ways. Which is which is great. <laughs> yeah, you know? like because I'm I'm totally with you. Where like yes, I'm fighting, getting killed by the same guy like yeah. nine times, and it's not even a boss. It's just like a man. Yeah, yeah. There are just guys out in the world, and I'm like, I just can't get the timing yeah. down. And I'm like, I could go play The Division or Baba Is You or watch a movie that I need to go or like play with my dog. Like there there are all these things, and I'm like. Is it okay to just give it up sometimes? Yeah, I feel like it probably is. I mean, the weird irony of a, of a series of games, or you know, not a series, but a bunch of games that are uh, sort of all about all about the redundant the, the the repetition of death is that you have to sp- spend some of your actual life getting good at them. Yeah, and I mean, if if like if I had a PlayStation and sixty bucks. I would, and I was like, and I, you're, I was like in jail or on an island or didn't have anything else going on. I'd be yeah. like, hell yes. But sinking more and more times in, in something like this, where it's not even, it's not even a time sink in like that. Oh, I'll go it's like, I mean, you could say like Red Dead or, or Breath of the Wild are time sinks because they're massive, huge, sprawling worlds. Uh, but it's a time sink that's um, like it's it's so it's so much about repetition and about precision. And some people are really into that, and I respect the hell out of that. Totally, yeah. It, uh, yeah. It's one of those things where like people on staff who love it or pe- people in the audience, like when they love something like that, I so appreciate it and I can see why this game and FromSoft are well respected. I just don't think I will ever be able to like have the attention span to want to get good at them. Yeah. A friend of mine raised an interesting point, which was that if they if they put button cues in as like a training wheels mode. Oh, yeah. It wouldn't actually change the difficulty of the fights, but it would make it a little bit easier to kind of parse what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, even if it was like a crazy fast button press thing, like that's one of those, that's like, that's that would be a UI thing. Yeah. That's like whenever this person's in this position, the little, you know, X pops up or whatever. Yeah, something um, like that I think would help me so immensely because it is that thing of like right now where I don't know how I'm going to have to react when I show up to a guy who I haven't seen before. And I don't feel the impetus to be like, let me learn how to deal with him first, and then I'll do it. I'm just like, no, I just want to attack him. Like, why? Why can't I just break his mm-hmm. parry and go? Like, it, there's something about like, I don't want to take the time 
to deal with this one guy because then I know I'm going to have to take the time to deal with another guy just in that same way. Yeah. And then probably get killed by a chicken when I'm not looking. Exactly. Um, and then, I mean, you always you always kick yourself when you find out there's some stupid, obvious thing you should be doing exactly. from your friend. And yeah. then you're like, I mean, it's hilarious because like Zach and Brian and I had sort of almost, we all cross reference different things from each other that we should be working on or should be doing or whatever. I'm like, yeah. there's a training guy. And Brian's like, there's a, a flashback sequence. Um, and it's just, I don't know. It's, it makes, that makes you want to go back to it. Yeah. Like it's almost like a, a, a viral gameplay loop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I always think of this with, um, playing arcade games where, you know, you have 25 cents and you go and you pump it in there and you're like, I'm going to try this. And you, or even like a carnival game where you're like, I'm going to try to, you know, shoot the water gun at the clown's mouth and blow up the balloon fastest. And you do it at the time and you get the pressure on and there's this sort of panic to go with it. And then you go away from it. And while you're, I'm not always thinking about carnival games, but like in your head, you're sort of passively being like, how do I do better at that next time? And you might go and still screw it up again, but there's this kind of like, like you're thinking about what you did wrong. And I think that that's what gets its hooks into so many people with yeah, soft games. That's fair. Um, so do you think like, cause obviously you've continued with Bloodborne. And I know you were saying like the setting of Sekiro doesn't inherently interest you in the way that something like Bloodborne does. Do you think like having those conversations, are you going to want to keep going back to Sekiro? Do you see yourself like hitting a wall and just saying, forget it with it or. I don't know. I don't think I've hit the wall quite yet. Yeah. Um, I mean, we'll see how I feel in coming weeks because there's other stuff coming out. Yeah. Um, but, you yeah, know, if I want sort of a more passive time sink, there's, you know, days gone to mess with. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't I, I don't know. Like, I also still – I've got this feeling where I'm like I'm far enough into Bloodborne where I want to finish that. And that's – that's a lot of work, and it's also. Yeah. I feel like I feel like it's it's. I will be legitimately impressed with myself if I finish Bloodborne by 2021. Really? Because I go through I go through phases, and this isn't just with blood with a game that are difficult. Like I did the same thing with. Uh, I think I did it with Red Dead. I did it with. Um, I, I I reach a point where I just need to stop because I'm sick of it. Yeah. Like it's like when you get two thirds of the way through a burrito, and you're like, I'm saving the rest for later. <laughs> And it's just too big. It's yeah. just there's too much there. I did it with Witcher. I did it with Phantom Pain. Some of my favorite games ever where I'm just like, I had to put it down, walk away, do something else, um, you know, for like a matter of weeks or months. And yeah. then and it, I always feel like a scrub because I come back and I'm like, you know, it'll be <laughs> like the fact that I'm like, hey, guys, I'm back into Bloodborne. Everyone's like, hey, it's 2019. That game is five years old. What are you talking about? <laughs> But even still, it's it's totally one of those things for me, too. I wish games had, like, a really great succinct, like, previously on, but of, like, mechanics. Oh, yeah. Like, here's what you need to do in order to be good at the game and again, because you played 100 hours. Dude, I jump back into Breath of the Wild, and I have no idea how to play that game anymore. Yeah. I, I never finished Breath of the Wild. I got halfway through, like, mm -hmm. the Divine Beasts. If I go back to it and I want to, I'm just going to restart, because, like... I think it's a smarter idea. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, you, you retrain yourself. Yeah. You get the adventure a little bit more. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't see myself. I don't see myself spending the time to complete Sekiro in the it, as needed. I'm also yeah. curious. It's an Activision published game. They are. Yeah. Um. I mean, they make some of the best selling games in the world. Like they are sort of known for being like, what do people want? I'm wondering if they will patch in a difficulty shift in any way or any kind of accessibility thing, um, or if they were kind of rolling the dice, being like, how does an incredibly punishingly? Because I would say the skill set required to play something like. Um, to get good at, at Sekiro and, and complete it is the same as like, I don't know, like finishing or not finishing, but like prestiging Call of Duty. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like the masters of Call of Duty. Exactly. There is a skill level there. I will never attain. Yeah. I mean, they have, I mean, even with like blackout and stuff like that yeah. requires you to be good at a game. And yes, a bunch of the people you're playing are 13 year olds, but like, you know, there's still like somebody in there who's much better than you most likely. Yeah. It's um, fascinating to me. Like you were saying it's place in Activision's catalog. Cause like right now, if you take out, they don't have destiny anymore. Mm -hmm. They have call of duty obviously. And that will continue in perpetuity. They have Sekiro now. And then they have, they made some remakes of Crash and Spyro, but maybe probably won't make more new yeah. ones. Like, I mean, we think of Activision as a, as a publisher as being sort of the most sort of accessible and casual stuff out there. I would say, um, you know, you think like, you think Call of Duty, you think Skylanders, you think yeah. like, I mean, and they're, they're, you know, Blizzard is part of them, you know, yeah. like it's. And King is owned. Oh, yeah. No, too. Candy so, yeah, Crush. Candy yeah. Crush so like they there. make arguably the most casual games on the planet and then suddenly they buddy up with the get good company yeah so it, it's an odd choice yeah i'm crazy i'm curious to see the life it has because obviously like the critical acclaim has been great for it but yeah i'm very curious there's a lot of people in this office who absolutely love it and then there's some people who are like me who are like ah, i'll accept that other people love it and i'll mm -hmm. play something else for now yeah but it's yeah. exciting to see
It's good stuff. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Is there anything else in the world of PlayStation going on you want to talk about? It's just you and I in the room. Yeah. Move on. Yeah, they just bailed on us. They had to yeah. go. What are, what are they ranking? Like the top, uh, the 20... top 25 Switch games. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so we have to rank the top 25 PS4 games. Uh, Do we? Yeah. Top 24. We don't get... Do we see top... <laughs> <laughs> I think 25. Um, I don't know. Those are always weird because we do these weird checkups. We had somebody tweeted us the other day who was like, hey, I just got a PS4. I've only I've only had Nintendo consoles since 2007. What have I missed? And I'm like, a lot. There's been a lot of games, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, like... <laughs> it's always fun ranking them, and we did the last ranking when you were gone, so we put Kiwami 1 on the list. As yeah. Like, oh, we'll give it to you, but then you're like... Kiwami and I yelled at you guys, yep. and everyone's like, zero's better, and I'm like, you're right, and then people... I don't know. It's yeah, a it, long story. It's always fun to do, but those lists change. We do them, I think, every six months or so. So there yeah. will be an update coming soon. And yeah. If, and if you, dear listeners at home, are ever stuck with a new system and don't know where to start with things, go check out one of those lists because they are updated and maintained. Yes, yeah. We very much keep them, even after a little bit of the life of the console, to mm-hmm. do like final lists. Uh, moving on, want to move on to another memory card segment. Uh, we have one from another listener of the show. And again, thank you so much. A lot of people have been sending in. You can send them to beyond at IGN.com. Please put memory card in the subject line so I know what they're actually relevant to. But thank you to everyone who's been sending them, sharing personal stories of their lives. Really appreciate it. That's obviously what we want the segment to be about. Uh, And this week's we have from a listener named Tyler who wrote in. Max, would you like to read Tyler's letter? Sure. Hey, folks. So my memory might come across sad, but believe me, it's a good memory of mine. Growing up, I was very much into Twisted Metal. I played literally every single one. Absolutely loved the franchise. Well, when I was about 10, my parents went through a real nasty divorce. My mom walked out of on us, and I wouldn't hear from her, t- or I wouldn't hear from her 12 years later. Uh, my dad was left to care- take care of three kids. During this difficult time, my dad decided to take me to the mall, just him and I. We walked by an EB Games. I saw a huge poster with half the face of Sweet Tooth plastered over a black banner with the words Twisted Metal Black written across. I never read gaming magazines at the time, so I had no idea what was coming out. This was such a surprise to me and my dad. And my, oh, to me and my dad clearly saw it in my eyes how happy I got. He said to me along the lines of, I need to get something in here. I was so confused because why would he need something in there? He doesn't play games. Sure enough, he bought a copy of Twisted Metal Black and gave it to me. One of the greatest memories with my dad and this franchise, even though the game was extremely dark, it definitely made me happy. Sorry for the rant, but hope you enjoyed the story. Holy crap, that's adorable. Yeah, I love that. I I love the idea of like a dad being like, I need to get something in here. Like that's all he could come up with on the spot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) was just this vague. I love that. It's like, I have to go in here. No, that's, um, I would say that's the sweetest thing about Twisted Metal. (laughs) Like that is that is seriously sweeter like, than sweet tooth. Sweeter than sweet tooth. No, that's like that's that's adorable. Um, yeah, I had a, I had a story. I feel like I don't know. Should I? I, should, I could save it for another time. We can if you want to. Yeah. Um, no, I have like a I have just such a sort of love affair with Metal Gear. Yeah. Um, that goes back like I, I've thought about um, those uh those like boss fight books series. Yeah. I've thought about like trying to write one for Metal Gear Solid Five. I feel like it's a weird thing to just sort of contemplate in a podcast, <laughs> but like not so much even the sort of a technical breakdown of it or like a deep dive, but like a memoir associating sort of surrounding it and just the. Um, no, screw it. I'll talk about Metal Gear. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Metal Gear, I don't, I don't even remember the first time I sort of encountered it, but my best friend uh, Chris uh, had it, and he was like really into it, and I just remember sort of you know like you hear words that just sort of sound. You know, you're like you get used to hearing them. Metal Gear, Metal Gear Solid, and I was like, I never thought about like what does that mean? What does the, the name say me? And I didn't know any other Metal Gear games. Yeah. And then for whatever reason, it just hooked me. And I was just getting into anime at the same time, so like this intersection of like cyborg ninjas and like sort of American movie aesthetics and like the fact that it was like I was I was like super into uh, I was really into like military hardware as a kid. Like okay. I was watched a lot of action movies and was like really into that whole thing and. For them to be like, yeah, this is sort of like The Rock, except there's like animal themed superheroes. I mean, it's sort of like anime infused G.I. Joe kind of stuff. Yeah. And so I gradually I think I like started sort of watching him play it as like he was in the middle of the game and I got increasingly invested and sort of did my my own research. And I think I started my own file and started screwing around. It was terrible at the game because I'm bad at games, um, but messed around and then uh, kind of just got really into it myself and started like my, my, at the time I think I think I was saving up to buy a PS1 but my mom was super anti-violent video games so she wouldn't let me get anything rated M for mature mm-hmm. um Especially something that was about military stuff and guns and things. <laughs> Even though you like you were into it as a kid, was that just like self interest or did you um, have like toys and stuff or I had so I managed to get like 
You mean like Metal Gear stuff? Or, or no, or I just, just mean like military. military. It, I like was, if she didn't I would, want like guns. So that's so. that was the word loopholes. I would check out like books from the library about okay. it. Um, there was an eyewitness book about special military forces equipment that weirdly enough reminded me when the Phantom Pain came out, the whole weird menu of like gun customization and like paint your Jeep pink and you know pick out new camo outfits mm-hmm. was so reminiscent of that that it felt like specifically this is a game made for like fifth grade me. <laughs> um, and it's, I don't know. So I would I would read you know read up on Harrier jets and like you know submachine guns and gotcha. watch True Lies repeatedly and stuff like that. And then um, you know as in a, you know I would like, draw pictures of like you know high tech gear and robots and crap like that in my mm-hmm. notebooks. And so Metal Gear became like my big fixation, and I would just had to play it at my friend's house basically. Uh, and then we heard murmurs of a sequel. Um, and to this day, I don't think I've ever been as excited for a game as Metal Gear Solid Two. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was. I think it was like the summer before. It have been right after freshman year, um, and I did like I was you know getting more and more into anime and and you know into Gundam models and stuff. And I think like the summer I was at I was at camp. The trailer for Metal Gear Solid Two dropped, and this was like this was like early on going on IGN.com. Yeah, I was going to ask like it, you saw it via like a small I quick saw, time yeah, video like a or tiny whatever. quick yeah. time file <laughs> um, and my friend had like cable internet so we managed to like download a, a high res you know probably 480p <laughs> video of it Yeah, um, and then we had to like install DivX to watch it um, and we would just watch it like repeatedly and this that was all stuff from like the tanker level um, and before I went away to summer camp I bought this issue of uh, PSM PlayStation Magazine that had the Joe Madera cover of uh, Snake and Olga Gerlukovich and like Revolver Ocelot on it and I would just I obsessed over that article like I just like sc- I looked at all the screenshots and I remember um, I remember I had a I had a CD of like burn music and I remember sitting on a bench at my my artsy fartsy summer camp um, with my disc man listening to the ending theme of Metal Gear Solid 1 <laughs> and drawing fan art of Snake and like going into the computer lab and getting yelled at for printing out pictures of like Yoji Shinkawa artwork and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I got back from summer camp and I was actually moving to California. This was, I was in Connecticut at the time. Um, I got back from camp and it was sort of this like sad end of the summer where my mom was like, yeah, we got to pack up. We're going, we're leaving. Um, and I was like, can I, can I spend the night at Chris's like one last time? And uh, so I went over to his house and, you know, we we're just like, what should we, what should we do? And he's like, let's, let's beat, let's beat Metal Gear, dude. Let's just like power through. Let's pull an all nighter. And so we put in Metal Gear and we sat down and we played through the entire game. Oh, wow. And at about, I think my mom was coming to pick me up to literally drive to California that day <laughs> at probably like eight in the morning or something to get an early head start. Uh, <laughs> it's like four thirty five in the morning. It is God. dawn and we are bashing our heads against Metal Gear Rex. Um, and my friend had one of those like off-brand, not PlayStation controllers. Like a Nyko. It was some, yeah, like yeah, a Mad, Mad Cats, Cats or yeah. something. And he's <laughs> he's just bashing his head. We're just exhausted. We've been eating junk food all night. And he's fighting Rex and he just dies. And we I heard that stupid like Gray Fox uh, cutscene where it's like, after Zanzibar. And he just like takes a controller and just one hand, it just hurls against the wall and it explodes oh. into like a million pieces Plugs in a second controller, beats him first try, it burns at the end of the game. I pro- probably cried or something, yeah. but it just ended. I got in the car and then drove to California. And then that was uh, like August 2001. And Metal Gear Solid 2 was coming out in November oh, 2001. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I was like super into it. The the one of the one of the first things I ever pre-ordered was the McFarlane toy solid snake figure mm-hmm. because I, I didn't have, at that point I had a PS one, but I didn't have a PS two. So yeah. I couldn't play it. And I had uh, this other friend who did have a PS two and we like bonded over geeking out about video games and stuff. And I was like, dude, you got to get metal gear solid two when it comes out. And he's like, Oh, is it, what's it about? And I was like, oh, it's, it, it, yeah, <laughs> it's give me a minute. Um, and so like we ran it and he was like, you know, he's a nice kid, but he wasn't like, we weren't into the same stuff really. Like he was like a casual weeaboo pretty much. Mm. Um, and we, I went over to his house and we rented it. I remember just like being like, holy crap, like oh, looking at the manual and the car in the car to his house. We popped it in and we played through all the tanker stuff, which I knew like the back of my hand because we played the the tanker mission demo a whole demo, bunch. Yeah. Um, and w- <laughs> we get to like the riding stuff and I'm like, what is any of this? And I think <laughs> I wound up just being like sort of overwhelmed and like I just like started crying and he was like, dude, what's like what's wrong? Like what's wrong with you? I don't. I don't think it was specifically like the the ride and twist. It was more just like, 
I don't, I don't know, something, something that just hit me. And it was just like, yeah. I was just like immensely homesick and I missed my best friend. And this kid was like, he was, you know, he's a nice kid, but we just, you know, just didn't, we weren't like, it best. wasn't the yeah, same. It wasn't the yeah. same. Um, and so I didn't, I just kind of didn't, I didn't play Metal Gear Solid 2 when it first came out because I didn't have any means to. And, you know, he played it and he's like, it was cool, I guess. And I was like, you don't have any appreciation for this. <laughs> um, and then the following summer, um, my best friend came over, came to stay with me. He came to stay for like th- three weeks and just screw around. And he packed his PS2 in his bag. And the first thing we did, the first night he was there, was just pop in Metal Gear Solid 2 mm-hmm. and burn through it in one night. Um, and yeah, we, it was it was amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's so awesome. And that- it was, yeah, that's like why it's sort of cemented as like my favorite game ever. Yeah, it's I- just... I mean, there's like so much probably a therapist could have like a field day, which is like the act of like playing that game the night that you're leaving to go move across. The oh, yeah. And completely change your life. Like that's obviously such like a transfixed moment for you. Yeah. And I can understand so much why you love that series. To yeah. The extent that you do. And it's I mean, it's it's funny now because like he's sort of um, my buddy, Chris, I, he was, you know, hung out with him this this last summer. And mm-hmm. um, now I'm like more into games than he is like the joke i always said was like he had he had video games and i'd go to his house to play his games and i always had like more toys and lego and stuff and he wound up uh he wound up getting a job um doing the like cartoon illustrations on like lego boxes and like oh, doing wow. like you know little like lego web comics and stuff yeah. and i wound up talking about video games for a living and i'm like did we get like freaky friday what yeah happened? you swapped when yeah. you moved across country or something yeah, yeah. but it's uh yeah. That's amazing. That's, Thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. Of course. Yeah. It. I'm glad you decided to talk about it. Yeah. No, I mean Metal Gear was sort of my entry point into into video games and anime and that was that's a huge, you know, fundamental part of my my life. So Yeah. Um yeah, I'm, I'm it'll be interesting to see what the hell Death Stranding is. <laughs> yes. When, we, when that game finally comes out at some yeah. point, maybe we'll find out about it in a state of play. Hell yeah. Uh, anyway, Max, thank you so much for sharing that. And if you would like to write in with a memory of yours related to your PlayStation history, remember you can write in at beyond at IGN.com with the subject line memory card, and we'll be sure to read some of those on the show each week. Before we wrap up, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, If you do have other questions that you want to write into the show for Rapid Fire, obviously with uh, the state of play and Sekiro this week, didn't have too much time for those, but you can write in at beyond at IGN.com. Please put Rapid Fire in the subject line so I know what it's related to and don't think it's a random PlayStation memory. Uh, Also, because obviously now we are an audio show. If you didn't know about that, uh, you can find us on basically any podcasting app that you use. You can find us on Pandora, Spotify, iTunes, uh, Google Podcasts, a whole host of other services. If you're listening to us on there, please be sure to rate us and subscribe to us. Uh, It really helps the show out, especially now that we're like a decade old, the show itself. Those feeds have been sitting around for quite a while. Oh, yeah. Help us beat Car Talk on the charts. Other than that, uh, as Brian mentioned, he's going to be at PAX East this weekend. We do have a PAX East IGN panel that's going on, but in addition to that, we'll be covering everything big that comes out of that show. Obviously, Gearbox won't stop teasing things, so we'll probably have Borderlands 3 to talk about next week. And for reference... I think it's going to be Duke Nukem forever and ever. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. Forever after. They they would do that. I wouldn't be shocked. Um... (laughs) We also, uh, because the show is recorded on Tuesday and posted on Wednesday, we will probably have missed the announcement of PlayStation Plus free games for April, so we'll talk about that next week. Uh, but other than that, Max, where can people find you? On the- I'm just Max Scoville on Twitter and on Instagram. If you want to see my Gundam models, I'm still building. They're over on my Instagram. All of, uh, all of the model work you've been doing is amazing. Thank you. I love I'm actually I'm building a Metal Gear right now. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. yeah. Like from um, scratch or from... No, there's a, there's a, there's a kit. Um, oh, okay. A friend of mine got it and was like, I have no idea what to do with this. And I was like, I'll help. And so uh, <laughs> I'm building a Sahelanthropus. Oh, awesome. I'm excited yeah. to see it uh, fully come together. Uh, and I am at J.M. Dornbush on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me there to obviously be talking about Kingdom Hearts and uh, my my good pup, Loki. Hell yeah. He's a, a good dog. He's pretty great. Plug his Instagram. Uh, his Instagram is at Loki God of Cute. Nice. So you can find him there. Uh, we haven't been posting recently because he was a little sick for a week or two, but he's on the up and up. He's all good now. So we'll be posting a lot more there. Anyway, this has been Beyond Episode 584. My name is Jonathan Dornbush. I am your host, and I am joined by Max Scoville. Last survivor of the Nostromo signing off. Thank you so much.